It's a bright sunny day and sitting tall and proud on the stocks of a slipway is the towering hull of a huge ship ready for launch. This is the RMS Titanic, the newest of the Harland & Wolf shipyard's works in Belfast and very soon she'll be rumbling down the slipway to float for the very first time. But Titanic was just one in a long and proud line of ships built by this legendary company and remarkably most of the work was done by hand. Men drove home red-hot iron rivets into hard steel with huge hammers. They scaled enormous scaffolding that kissed the clouds and overlooked their home city. Craftsmen, artisans, iron workers, riveters, boilermakers, they all came together to create an army thousands strong to build massive ships all in-house. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Lighter Designs, and this is a small glimpse into the lives of the men and the shipyard that built the Titanic. Harland & Wolff was founded in Belfast in 1861 by Edward James Harland and Gustav Wilhelm Wolff. The shipyard was originally tasked with building ships for the Bibby Line, and the ships delivered by the yard sported design innovations that instantly set Harland & Wolff apart from their competition. Gustav Schwab, responsible for helping to partially fund the shipyard, and who also had a sizeable investment in the Bibby Line, would later join forces with Thomas Ismay to acquire a particular struggling shipping company, the White Star Line. Schwab, seeing the opportunities for a fruitful partnership, made a deal with Ismay that Harland & Wolff would provide White Star Line with new ships to fill out their new fleet, and in return, White Star Line would promise to acquire their future ships only from Harland & Wolff. It was with this arrangement that the wheels of fate began to turn, and the stage was now set for the construction of some of the most famous ships the world has ever seen. Fast forward to the second decade of the 1900s and Harland & Wolff had exploded into one of the world's largest shipping concerns. Located in Belfast, Ireland, it was a vast complex with shops dedicated to just about everything you can imagine that needed making in-house to form, piece by piece, the entirety of a massive ocean liner. There were workshops dedicated just to making portholes by their hundreds. There were fan workshops, paint workshops, engine and boiler room sheds, carpentry shops, and many, many more. Now this vast industrial town of a shipyard was tasked with the design and construction of the White Star Line's newer superliners, the Olympic class. It would require a massive amount of skill and manual labour to get the job done right. Now these just weren't fancy boats for the wealthy, after all, they were a source of national pride, so they had to be built to an exacting standard without a single rivet out of place. Olympic and Titanic were, at the time, the largest man-made objects ever to be built, and their splendour and beauty all pay a testament to the craftsmanship and keen eye for detail that went into every square inch of their massive 45,000 ton structures. Harland & Wolff was well known for supplying White Star Line with the largest and most luxurious, safest liners at sea. It was a partnership, after all, that by 1910 had gone back decades, and it culminated thus far in the previous generation of massive luxury liner known as the Big Four. Olympic and Titanic would be the new golden standard of seafaring, and they would require the utmost in design and workmanship. And here's how they did it. The shipyard was very particular about the men that it hired. They had to keep a rigid set of standards for those they did employ. Some 3,000 men were assigned to build Titanic. That's about 20% of the yard's total workforce. Many of them were as young as 16 when they started at the yard. But how did you even find yourself employed at one of the world's biggest shipbuilding operations in the first place? Well, there were three main ways that a prospective worker could get their foot in the door. Some young men from more well-off families joined the yard as a pupil or premium apprentice. In fact, this is exactly how Lord Edward Peary, the shipyard's chairman by 1912, had started out way back in 1862. After paying a fee of around £100, or what would today be US dollars or £11,000, the pupil would be taken on as a gentleman apprentice with hopes of rising through the ranks into shipyard management. This apprenticeship would see the pupil learning basically every trade involved in shipbuilding, and if his work was enough to impress the superiors, he would see himself rewarded with a sizeable promotion at the end. 
Titanic's chief architects, Alexander Carlyle and Thomas Andrews, had both worked their way up in Harland and Wolfe as apprentices, where they both spent tireless hours mastering their craft in each and every workshop of the shipyard. Andrews actually began his five-year apprenticeship first at the joiner's shop, where he spent three months learning to craft the ship's wooden fixtures. From there, he spent several months with the cabinet makers, refining his skill at creating furniture for the ships, but soon he moved on to other areas. For the first three and a half years of his apprenticeship, Andrews learned everything from framing and plating to painting and riveting until he finally came to the real challenge. 18 full months spent in the drawing office. The workers in this area, called draftsmen, were responsible for drawing up the ship's plans, amounting to thousands of pages of blueprints detailing the ship's design down to the last detail. In fact, as part of the process, some plans were even marked out in full scale on the empty floor of massive warehouses. Now this is truly the backbone of any ship's construction, so an apprentice would spend the most amount of time here plotting out every porthole and rivet, and it's for very good reason. The apprenticeship was designed to shape workers into well-rounded shipwrights who would later oversee the construction of ships on their own. And this is exactly what happened in Andrew's case. 20 years after he began his apprenticeship, he found himself as managing director of the yard, overseeing the conception and completion of Olympic and Titanic alongside Carlisle and Peary. But if your family couldn't afford the fee or you weren't interested in being promoted to management, there were other options available to get started in the yard. A prospective worker could enter the shipyard as a basic apprentice without needing to pay a fee. These were usually tradesmen intent upon becoming artisans or workers in one specific area of shipbuilding. While they were rarely promoted into upper management roles, they would typically rise through the ranks in the trade of their choosing. The final, and perhaps most dehumanising method of finding work would be by means of casual labour. Prospective employees, many of whom were desperate for work of any kind, would assemble outside the yard at around 6am every day, at which time a foreman would assess the crowd to pick out a crew from amidst the hopeful faces. There were no interviews, tests or evaluations of any sort. If the foreman liked the look of you, you were hired. It was common for a foreman to choose the same men repeatedly if he knew that they were good workers, but this also meant that many Many unfortunate men, who the foreman didn't fancy, would have to return home to their families with no hope of pay. For those that did successfully find employment with Harland and Wolf, the roles they could find themselves in were as varied as the sprawling yard's facilities themselves. Work was primarily divided into two separate areas of the yard, the shipyard proper and the engine works. The shipyard was of course concerned with the construction of the ship itself, while the engine works dealt with construction of her boilers, engine and propelling machinery. It took thousands of highly skilled labourers working across various departments to bring a ship like Titanic to life, and the roles were far too many to list here, but among the most iconic jobs a worker could find themselves in at a shipyard would be among the team of riveters, generally composed of four men, working in tandem to carefully and precisely drive the ship's rivets into her hull, either by hand or with the help of hydraulic machines. The job was of the utmost importance and required no small amount of skill as these rivets, about three million of them in Titanic's case, literally held the ship together. Riveters were paid per rivet, not per hour, and this meant that many workers exacted schemes to ensure that they would take home a few extra pence at the end of the week. One scheme required the heater boy, responsible for heating the rivets in small furnaces, as the name implies, would sneak into the yard early before work began and light the fire that heated the rivets so that the rest of the team would waste no time getting started and they could eke out a few more rivets by the end of the day. But it's important to note that being paid per piece didn't, surprisingly, encourage the workers to rush or deliver sloppy work. A member of the team called a rivet counter saw to that. Shipyard workers were actually proud of the ships that they built as well, meaning that even with their pay on the line, they generally did their best to make sure their work was of the utmost quality. For Harland and Wolf management, overseeing a workforce of this size was no easy task. And because of this, all workers were supplied with a list of rules they had to adhere to in order to continue with their employment. To start, workers were to arrive ready to work at 6.20am sharp every day, equipped with their own set of tools, either purchased with their own funds or gifted from a family member or friend, but never provided by the shipyard. Workers could only enter and exit the shipyard through the appropriate gates, otherwise they could be terminated on the spot. Upon entering the shipyard, a worker would be presented 
with a board, as it was known, which was a small square of wood used to keep track of the hours spent working. A worker's board was to remain on him at all times, only being surrendered during bathroom breaks, of which workers were allotted just seven minutes per day. An employee called a minute man was responsible for keeping track of these very important seven minutes and ensuring that no one took more than their fair share of bathroom time, if you want to call that fair. The board would also be turned over to an employee called a timekeeper at the end of the workday, whose job it was to calculate all the hours worked and the wages owed. Now this system was not without its flaws. The boards, being small wooden objects made for enjoyable projectiles for the workers to unceremoniously chuck at unsuspecting timekeepers, who would then have the unenviable task of rounding up all the boards that were now strewn about the floor. But what were the conditions in the yard actually like? Workplace safety regulations still had decades before they would be properly implemented, and this period in time was infamous for countless avoidable workplace accidents. Harland and Wolf were sadly no exception. Contrasted with the immaculate, elegant liners they were knocking together rivet by rivet, the workers knew very little of luxury. While building Titanic, eight men lost their lives, with about 250 more sustaining injuries. The constant hammering and use of loud machinery meant that many riveters were prone to deafness, and the handling of red-hot rivets often lent to burnt or calloused hands. Shipyards were also notorious for their use of asbestos in everything from insulation to a special mitt worn by members of the riveting teams to protect against the heat. Now this, of course, led to extremely high rates of cancer among shipyard workers. One rivet counter, Robert Murphy, tragically lost his life when the two wooden planks he was standing on gave way just as he raised his hand to count the rivets before him, and he fell 50 feet to his death as his fellow workers watched helplessly nearby. Now the danger didn't just extend to the time spent working on the ship either. One of the most infamous and tragic deaths associated with the building of Titanic actually happened not during construction, but on the day of her launch. It was a bright and cheerful day, and Titanic stood proudly on the slipway, finally ready to take to the water for the very first time. As a lively crowd and a number of proud shipbuilders looked on, the timber stays that were used to hold the ship in place were knocked away, and all eyes were on Titanic as she began to slowly slide down the ways. Cheers and applause followed as the vessel hit the water, but obscured from the crowd's view was the tragic and untimely demise of James Dobbin, a shipwright who was horrifically crushed by a falling wooden support as the ship was released from her stays, making him the first official victim of not yard number 401, but the RMS Titanic. To this day, there are a number of researchers that contend that the shipbuilders were at fault for the Titanic disaster. According to this theory, a lack of high quality steel led Harland and Wolf to use substandard iron rivets in the bow section of the ship, which were much weaker than their tougher steel counterparts. Other theories speculate that the company had settled for unskilled riveters due to a shortage of workers in the skilled trades, but it's simply not true. Despite the raised eyebrows, of all the parties blamed for the sinking, no fault was ever found on the part of Harland and Wolf. In fact, all evidence collected shows that the yard designed and constructed the liner to exacting specifications for her owners, and the strict standards put into place by the British Board of Trade. For all of the heartbreaking tragedy that befell the ship, she was, at the end of it all, still a well-designed and structurally sound vessel. Tests had been conducted on Titanic steel, and it was shown to be brittle, which was standard for the time. Advanced knowledge of the chemicular composition of metal and alloys was still decades away, and the shipyard did the best with what they had for the time. Had it not been for the unfortunate circumstances that historic night, Titanic may very well have enjoyed a successful career as her sister Olympic, the pride of her shipbuilders, who went on to delight seafarers for a remarkable 24 years. These vessels were not quickly slapped together and tossed into the sea with fingers crossed, they truly were the best that Edwardian engineering had to offer. Every rivet, frame and plate on Titanic was placed with the utmost care and it showed through in every square inch of her richly appointed structure. At the end of the day, what made people believe that Titanic was unsinkable was not her lavish appointments or her staggering size, but the solid and sound construction, a testament to the literal blood, sweat and tears poured into the liner by her builders, who were of course devastated to hear of the loss of their pride and joy once word had spread of her sinking. While Harland and Wolf did not succeed in building an unsinkable ship, what they did succeed in building was an unsinkable legend, a behemoth whose splendour will continue to transfix the world for generations to come.
Now this has just been a small glimpse into the lives of the men who built some of the world's greatest ships, but next time we'll have a deeper dive into the various disciplines, all of the shops and unique skills that actually made up the Harland and Wolf shipyard. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.